Welcome to the About Sex Podcast. I'm your host, Angela Skirtu, and you can find me at www.therapistinstlouis.com. And this is the About Sex Podcast. With me today is Courtney Brame, founder and podcast host of Something Positive for Positive People, a podcast that started as a suicide prevention resource for people navigating a herpes diagnosis. Now it's a sex positive nonprofit organization that helps connect people navigating stigma heal through the experiences of people with similar experiences. All right. So, I mean, I guess tell me a little bit more about how you started this podcast because we were actually just started. We just started talking about it. So like you said, it started kind of small. <laughs> yeah. So um, you can feel free to cut me off whenever. No, you do your you thing. if you let me talk, I would, like this episode time will run out <laughs> if you let me. <laughs> but um, so I was diagnosed with genital HSV type 2 herpes simplex virus, which is primarily genital herpes. Uh, back in, it's been, I'm on the eighth year. So exactly when it was kind of escapes me. But after my diagnosis, um, I just navigated the world, you know, the my own. What kind of happened? Like, because, you know, a lot of times when people, you know, herpes has a lot of stigma and values behind mm-hmm. it. And so what happened for you? What was that like? So for me, when I was diagnosed, um, I went to urgent care, which is just like a mini doctor um, who can come. I can go into get seen and get treated and go on about my business uh, after the diagnosis, I went home and started to figure out, damn, right, who else did I give this to? Mm. That was kind of my first reaction. So um, the most recent partners I had, I reached out to, and all of them said that they didn't have herpes or they didn't have any symptoms. Now, um, after that, I didn't have anyone to point the finger at. So it was mm-hmm. just a matter of, all right, well, that's good. No one else got it, but shit, now I got to deal with this. Yeah, and where did it come from? I mean, just for side notes, I mean, if ever you you do find out you have herpes. What you did was right. You know, you're supposed to contact all your partners. It's good if your partners still go and get themselves checked because you can have herpes. You can be a carrier of herpes, but not have any symptoms. Mm -hmm. And so even if they don't have symptoms, some of those partners still could have had herpes. You know, you don't know. Right. And even then, I think it's important to note here that getting tested for herpes without any symptoms is a complicated process for a number of reasons. Throughout the podcast recordings that uh, I've done, I found that there are people whose providers chose not to test them or they give them information saying, well, if you don't have any symptoms and you're good, just use condoms. And I learned that even using condoms, that doesn't protect you from uh, being exposed to genital herpes. So um, there are those kinds of barriers in place that keep people from being able to get um, tested even. Mm -hmm. And um, for whatever other reasons that uh, the CDC advises against herpes testing if there are no symptoms. Interesting. Okay. Well, so continue with your story. You, so oh, yeah. you found out, and I know we'll yeah. bunny trail a lot, but I also <laughs> want fine. people to learn, get educated. <laughs> it's a thing. <laughs> All right. So um, five years after my diagnosis, I discovered that there were online dating sites for people who were positive for STI. So I got on there and to me, like I was excited. It was like, wow, the hardest part about dating for me at that point in time was having to have this conversation with people. What was it like having the conversation? Hard. I mean, like, how did you (laughs) figure that out? (laughs) Very first, um, one of my first disclosures um, was actually really positive, actually. So um, one of my partners at the time, she actually knew someone who had genital herpes as well so she had an understanding of it she knew about the stigma she knew about outbreaks and these were all things that I had no idea about um, prior to my own diagnosis so she was way ahead of the curve and uh, we took our precautions we um, I wouldn't have sex during an outbreak obviously Mm -hmm. and we because that it's the risk Mm -hmm. correct Um, and then the second part of that question oh I think uh, after that disclosure, I hadn't had to disclose for a while. Um, When I got back out into dating after that, I think that's where the challenge sort of uh, reemerged. Okay. So on Tinder, and this is probably, (laughs) this is very discouraging. So um, (laughs) I was... We're going to bring the show down for a bit. (laughs) Right. 
<laughs> so I was uh, in communication with someone on Tinder and we were talking for maybe a week. I want to say a week to 10 days. And it was uh, a very good exchange. So we got to talking about meeting. And then at some point she made a comment about having chronic asthma. And I was like, oh, well, we all have our health conditions. It was like that time when I first found out I had genital herpes. Yeah. And that was the end of the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, I'm just going to drop yeah. this in. Well, th- that's an example, though, of, mm-hmm. you know, I think in your first partner, it sounded like she was very educated. So it was easier for you guys to have really good conversations and reasonable conversations, and it didn't end up being a barrier. But there's a lot of people that don't know much about herpes. And it does come with such a stigma that that's the conversation. Yeah. It's once that happens, it's like, all right, see ya, all you right. know? Mm-hmm. <laughs> So then you will fast forward. You said you found these dating websites Mm -hmm. for people with herpes. Yeah. So uh, once I got on there, it just removed the overthinking that I would do about when am I going to disclose? How am I going to disclose? What's the best time to do so? And it allowed for me to just be myself. Mm -hmm. And on that in that space, it was just a matter of like connecting with people and having conversations getting to know uh one another and through that process like there were chat rooms blogs forums different places where people can publicly share their thoughts and feelings about so it wasn't just about dating but it was also having a community Community. for people because i'm guessing you're not the only one who struggled with dating after (laughs) right after herpes (laughs) yeah (laughs) and so um i saw a number of times where people were like wanting to end their lives and just due to being so hopeless and finding people and it's just like well the hardest part to me at least was having to have the conversation about disclosure with someone Mm -hmm. but these were people who even in this space now having um, a community having support having uh, people who they didn't necessarily have to worry about rejecting them for herpes specifically we're still talking about wanting to end their lives after their diagnosis so at the time you know i try and reach out and just be like hey you know it's it's not that bad and this is i've come to learn one of the worst things that you can say to someone who's uh dealing with suicide ideation so over time you know i will say that I began to connect with more people who kind of felt the way that I did, like wanting to help the people who were struggling with suicide ideation. And I just asked, I was like, hey, would anybody be willing to share their experience? Because at the time I was 27, 28 year old black man. I can't relate to 22 year old white girl, 40, 50 year old white man or uh, anyone who's outside of my gender and ethnicity. So hearing Mm -hmm. it from me may not have the same impact of someone who is more relatable i see so what um what common things did you find across people so the common thing that i found across people is that the stigma was often much worse uh, than the physical symptoms for okay. many people. And I don't want to say for a lot or speak for everyone. Everyone's experience is different. But the most common thing is that the biggest challenge for most people was just dealing with the stigma of it. Um, the self-talk for ourselves, like often rejecting ourselves or solely pointing the finger at herpes for us not being able to connect with other people or for, um, it's also brought about like depression for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. I've taken a survey of people who listen to the podcast and it cut off at 110 uh, survey responses. So out of 110 people, um, the question was, if you listen to the podcast, at some point, did you experience any of these four negative um, emotions? One of which was depression. One was uh, suicide ideation. Another was self-harm tendency. And then the other one was attempted suicide. So 98% of the people who responded to the survey said that they experienced depression. Half of them experienced suicide ideation, about a quarter self-harm tendencies, and 6% of people said that they attempted suicide. Okay. Well, so a lot of people are kind of struggling with not only the stigma, but kind of getting through some of that depression and suicidal ideation. What did you find was helpful? What was helpful was people sharing their stories. So the very first uh, interview that I did, we met up, uh, Amy is her name. Mm -hmm. We met up in a car and um, 
we met up at a quick trip. I drove around looking for a quiet space to hit the record button for us to have our conversation. And so she Was this your first episode? Very first episode that I did with another person. So my first interview, yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and so um we're together, we're in the car and she pulls out a notepad. She's got like her notes of everything that she wants to talk about. And from start to finish, you just sort of worked up through um, the scale of various feelings. Um, We started out, both of us were nervous. We hadn't done this before. And then as we began to talk, we sort of got angry together. We got sad and cried together. We laughed a few times. We got excited. But ultimately, um, throughout the process, I just felt more of an energetic shift from her. Um, her posture began to change and her eyes lit up a little bit more. And the matter or having a space to express this thing that has been so challenging to talk through, talk about uh, for the first time, it was very um it was liberating. I think that that's a good word for it. Um, just being able to share your experience for the sake of someone else being able to take it and then run with it and do whatever they need with the information. So where do you find the people that you get stories from, that you get your interviews? So starting out just through the dating app, through the dating website, and then um, moving forward from there, people would find the podcast and they'd say, oh, thank you. This has been helpful. I like what you're doing. And then I'll just ask like, hey, well, do you want to share your experience? And beginning, uh, in the beginning of it, just about all the guests were anonymous, and it's really cool oh. to see that more people as of late are willing to put their face out there, put their names out there, because it's like not perpetuating stigma in any way, shape, or form, because it's like, hey, here I am, here's what, I, here's what happened, it is what it is. What do you think happens for you since, so before you did this show, <laughs> you were kind of, I mean, you got to decide who gets to know this information, so now... I mean, when people know about your podcast, they know that you have herpes. So how has life changed now that you're kind of a public figure? I will say I gave myself expectations of um, having to stay out of trouble, which I guess is a good thing. What do you mean stay (laughs) out of trouble? When I say stay out of trouble, I mean... No fisticuffs? Yeah, none of that, none of that. So like I'm very uh, mindful about like where I'm at, what I'm doing and Mm -hmm. taking better care of myself because if I want to be an example of someone who is positive for herpes because when I got diagnosed I didn't have anyone to look to Mm -hmm. Um, there were whatever allegations I don't know what ended up happening with the the Usher stuff that came out like I don't know if that's true or false or whatever but I think that might have been the closest thing and even then like in terms of an example for mm -hmm. you yeah so like I didn't know any other black men who were living with herpes like I saw even if you google it you'll see that there's plenty of um, 20s 30s year old white women who are advocating and saying, hey, you know, screw stigma. But I was like, (laughs) yeah, y'all got it easy. (laughs) You know, like show me what it's going to look like for me. So um, prior to my becoming open about it, I just had to figure it out for myself. And then becoming open about it, um, I think that my head was really down to trying to get things in a place to where other people can get what they need from the resource, Mm -hmm. more so than me really being able to care about, all right, well, what does this mean for me? I see. But so you, some part of it is you decided you wanted to be a role model in the way that you live your life. Yeah. Um, does it change how you make decisions then? Yes. Um, <laughs> yeah. especially, I like the response. It's like, yeah. well, one, two, three, you're right. I do change. <laughs> Tell me Um, about that. (laughs) I'll say as far as dating goes, because now I have people approach me from a very dark place, a very vulnerable position. Um, So, oh, so you're in a position of power. Yeah, (laughs) (laughs) that's yeah, that's a good way. Interesting. Okay. (laughs) Um, But to a lot of people, um, there's this there's there's a power dynamic for sure. Um, sometimes people reach out to me and they're like, oh, my God, I just got diagnosed and found your podcast. Thank you for doing what you're doing. Then there's, oh, my God, I just got diagnosed and I want to kill myself. Like, mm-hmm. F this. I don't want to deal with it. And then there's, oh, you have herpes, too. 
<laughs> you know, like that's kind of happened as well. So in terms of decision making, I have to point people in the right direction of where they need to go. If someone needs resources, I want to make sure to get them to the right resources. And as of now, I typically refer people to episodes of the podcast or I'll refer them to um, someone else who's in the public space of uh, herpes advocacy or activism um, so that they have more information because I don't focus on the statistics or the numbers at all. I focus on the experiences mm -hmm. because the numbers, they just change depending on language and there is no consistent language um, across the board. Mm -hmm. Which I, I kind of want to put in a word for why I think the doctors aren't testing if you're not showing symptoms is the stigma that um, quite a few people live with herpes unknown for many years. It can be latent or dormant. Um, or you can be a carrier but not be the kind of person that will have symptoms. Mm -hmm. So um, if if you can live without the stigma for some people, I think it's it's better for them than getting the test. And then that changes, like for some of these people you're describing, it changes their entire life. Um, and so I believe that is one piece of why doctors are trying not, like, if you're not outbreaking, you're not having symptoms, you're at lower risk for transmitting the disease as long as people are engaging in safe sex, then sometimes I think in that case, if for, that's the mindset is maybe it's better not to um, get this diagnosis. And then now you have to learn to live with this stigma that, I mean, well, tell me about this because you are yeah. living with herpes. So what are the symptoms like? You know, some people have no idea. <laughs> so uh, I'll, I consider myself to be lucky in terms of outbreaks. I had my first outbreak and then I found that some of the triggers for other people don't apply to me. So some people say chocolate, peanut butter. Um, there's a arginine, I believe. I don't know if that's how you pronounce it, but I've seen it in writing all the time. And um that's something that's in like a lot of protein supplements. These are things that have been proven to trigger outbreaks. So one of the first things that I Googled was how to manage herpes because mm -hmm. I thought that I was going to have a permanent outbreak and that was just what my genitals were going to look like for the rest of my life. And then when I found out, oh, these things go away, they come and go. Mm -hmm. And, and all you can you manage really, how often they outbreak. Well, I wouldn't say like how often, but you can just manage uh, like if it happens, like there, there are preventive measures that you can take, which is just simply taking care of yourself, like diet, exercise, stress management, okay. um, nutrition. I don't like to say diet. Oh, yeah. Nutrition. Diet freaks people out and, and uh, a lot of people are struggling with mm -hmm. <laughs> nutrition and movement really um so what it did for me was taught me to manage my stress um i got a personal trainer and i utilized my personal trainer for a while he taught me how to eat and i got back into working out and so i kept outbreaks away until uh, i moved out and i moved down to texas i was there for a few years and i had gotten fired from a job that was a very stressful situation so i felt maybe there was something coming on mm -hmm. and what i would do in that case is just take the medication and the way that i describe the sensation of knowing if an outbreak is coming is like let's say you a mosquito bites you and you like slap and you scratch and there's like a sensation that follows scratching the itch for a few seconds that's what it feels like for me whenever an outbreak is coming on now keep in mind that if i had that feeling it just happened two to three times over the last eight years okay so you've learned kind of how to predict a little bit what it's like and manage it enough with self-care and yeah most people would you say most people who are diagnosed if they learn that management they do a pretty decent job of managing outbreaks as you say i would say many people um of the it's been i'm at 121 episodes of the podcast now so out of those interviews maybe 80 to 100 have been with people who have herpes all talking about their different experiences and these seem to be the common denominators of people really just slowing down and prioritizing taking care of themselves uh more than anything else um i think that a common thing prior to that is like a lack of self-awareness more than anything and with a herpes diagnosis you now have to take care of yourself you know it's mm -hmm. more of like a compass for you to guide you in the right direction so if I have an outbreak it's like okay what is this telling me am I needing more sleep am I eating terribly do I need to take a break from drinking like am I resting so it gives you an opportunity to really look and see what it is that your body needs 
really interesting. So I have chronic back and neck pain, and I have to do the exact same thing, which is if I stay on top of my health and exercise, then it stays manageable. It's not like to the point where I'm like, ah, hunchbacking, yeah. you know? <laughs> Yes, that's a but term. You prevent that, yeah. But you have to when you. It seems like when you get one of these life long diseases, the people who do well with it, that's what they do. It's just a like severe self care, um, where you're just like, no, I've got to stay on the straight and narrow and take care of myself. But people who don't, they just really, really suffer. And I wonder if that's what's going on with the people who maybe suffer with depression and suicidal ideation. Maybe they didn't have good habits before, and they struggled to create those habits afterwards. And I could imagine, you know, well, if, with depression and suicidal thoughts, those are very stressful. So you're probably having more outbreaks, which probably is flame, inflaming the cycle. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Uh, that's a very good way of putting it. Like they just go hand in hand. It's a vicious cycle. I have outbreaks because I'm stressed about this and I'm stressed about this because I have outbreaks. Mm -hmm. So what's something for anybody kind of listening in, you'd want them to know you know, you've done a lot of these interviews, you've talked to a lot of people. So what would you want people to know who either don't have herpes or people who maybe were just diagnosed? Yeah. Um, people who don't have herpes, I would really want for them to know that we all know someone at this point with the statistics. We all know someone who has herpes. And the reason that we may not know whether or not we know someone who has herpes is just maybe they don't feel comfortable with sharing that information. And we have to understand that stigma is a real thing. And I want people to know that, you know, there are 98 percent of people who well, listen to the podcast specifically have at some point experienced depression after a diagnosis. So it's important to just be understanding of that. And for when people are disclosed to if someone comes to you saying that they're positive, then this is an this is something that's very vulnerable to them. Like this is an expression of vulnerability. So it's important to allow them to say what it is that they need to say and meet them without any judgment and just like hear them out because mm -hmm. we hear herpes and our immediate thoughts prior to my diagnosis at least was when was the last time I heard about herpes? Oh, a comedian made a joke or oh, someone said something shitty or it was like, oh, I don't want to get herpes. Only this kind of person gets herpes. And that isn't always the case. Just even from the interviews that I've done, like you hear that there are people who uh, followed strict religious beliefs and waited until they got married. And at some point, someone may have cheated, but this person now has herpes and they're stuck with it after having done so perfect or been so in line yeah, with what they that were taught to do. Narrow. I've heard that story actually a couple times where maybe they married a partner who was just active just it doesn't even have to be a cheating they may have been sexually active before getting married and the person waited until marriage but that's how they got herpes was from their partner and their partner didn't know because you can be asymptomatic yeah. you know and so I've definitely heard that story many times and I, I guess that's a good thing for people to keep in mind too is that first of all the stigma comes with what who's the kind of person who could get herpes and the reality is it literally could be anyone Another story that I even, because I, I get a lot of stories too, you know, I'm, I'm a therapist, so I get to hear everybody's secrets, but it was a woman who had been married to the one man her whole, like her whole life, but then they divorced, and the very first person she made love to, she said he was an upstanding businessman, you know, <laughs> you know, but it was her first sexual experience and she got herpes outside of marriage, and like, I wouldn't want people to stop experiencing positive sex, because that's still a part of our happiness and well-being, but to those people who don't have it, anyone looking any way can have herpes. And yeah. it doesn't mean anything about their character or, or who they are as a person. Mm -hmm. I think a funny way, a positive way of looking at it, it would be, you know, it would be more accurate to say herpes have humans. Like imagine oh. if you were herpes <laughs> and like, oh, dude, shit, I got diagnosed with humans. They're the worst, you know? <laughs> so like just being able to talk about it in humans such a way. Humans are pretty gross. Way. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> um, but yeah, like what would the human stigma be? You know, they're all divisive. They hate each other and blah, blah, blah. You know, so just. just <laughs> and they can never sit down and have a reasonable debate about politics. <laughs> never. <laughs> never! <laughs> um, but yeah. And then for the people who 
are positive. I would say I would want for them to know the power of community, the power of uh, seeking support, the power of just being able to express it and what comes after the healing starts, because all of these are healing processes. You know, there's always something underneath the herpes for various people. For some people, it may be um, how they are in relationships with certain types of partners. It uh, For others, there may be some shame associated with sex itself but one of the most common things that I'm seeing in the interviews that I have with people is that a herpes diagnosis really just comes through and shatters a person's idea of who they are because Mm. our sexuality and our identity are so interconnected that with the positive diagnosis it's like shit who am I now well I could definitely see that you know I was as you were talking I was really thinking about herpes across the lifespan. And I wondered if you saw any differences in younger generations versus older generations in terms of how they handle the diagnosis. Yeah. um, For younger generations, there's much more openness with the younger people that I've uh, talk to and by younger I mean maybe up to age 25 I would okay. say uh, who they seek the information they find it right away they're looking for resources like something positive for positive people so we're talking about like podcasts where they people can who are going to go listen to a podcast yeah, or, all right. <laughs> I mean it's going to be younger some some in the 30s some, yeah. you know yeah <laughs> uh, But they're active about wanting to do something about it. And then with older people, and when I say older, I'm talking maybe 40 plus, um, they're very resistant to change. Like they're at a place where um, maybe they've been diagnosed for so long that they're just accustomed to this life of isolation now. Mm -hmm. Or maybe they think that they they just got it. Like they got it under control. It is what it is. Um, There are people, I don't know that I've, had any conversations with people who were newly diagnosed at an older age nothing comes to mind right now but it's either you've had it for a while and you're older or you're newly diagnosed and you're younger um but everyone who's been between that like 25 to 35 age range has been across the board in terms of responses some people are actively seeking the information some people just need a little bit of approval to know that they're still worthy of love and that people are still going to want (laughs) to I, I hate to put, you know, myself included, people on blast. Like one of the first things that we say is nobody's going to want to, no one's going to love me anymore. But I'm coming to find that the real statement that we want to say is nobody's going to want to have sex with me anymore. Mm-hmm. So when it comes, when you look at it that way, it's like, oh, why do I think no one's going to want to have sex with me anymore? And then you begin to break that down into what it really means. Like you sort of, come to you cut through all of the bs there and you get to the emotion there and oftentimes it's shame around sex Hmm. so what kinds of what kinds of shame around sex are you seeing Ooh, i know random question but i'm like you brought it up (laughs) this is something that i i think that i've been dealing with myself is like self-rejection because yeah i'm open in the public about talking about my sci status um I don't really talk about my own experience much. I more so make it about the guests. And I think for the last three years, it's been so about the guests that I don't really know how I feel about it anymore because there's been such a transformational process. So what do you mean by self-rejection? Well, so what I mean by self-rejection is, okay, let's say I'm out and about, I'm out having a good time with friends and maybe some cute girl's looking at me and I'm like, oh shit, she's looking at me and I'll just be like, uh, do I want to tell her? Cause it's like a casual environment, yeah. you know? So maybe if someone wants to hook up, like mm-hmm. this would be something that they'd be like, no to, because then it affects their ability to be able to go and hook up if that's what it is they're looking for. So it's okay. definitely made me challenge that kind of thinking, but at the same time, like it's still there and I recognize mm-hmm. it in myself and I know that it's a thing for other people as well. So it's like you reject yourself before even trying something. Correct. Like just preventing yourself from that feeling, that gut wrenching feeling of this person doesn't want to sleep with me because I have herpes. But oftentimes that's not the reason. Like, maybe it'll be because of something you said or it could be political beliefs it could be that they're just not attracted to you you could just not be their type they may not like your shoes they may not like how your voice sounds i see so you can even when you do get rejected or you know you're playing the field that just doesn't work out then you can find a way to kind of 
focus it on the herpes and not on the grand scheme of maybe it just wasn't a good fit. Yes. Which one thing that the herpes does is it adds the shame, right? It's like, oh, I'm d- she doesn't want me because of this. Whereas that kind of global, like, well, yeah, maybe it wasn't a good fit. Maybe maybe it was better in the long run. Is less shaming and more. It's just looking at the grand picture of yeah. it, if that makes sense. And so it's less damning. That's mm-hmm. what I'm looking for. Ooh, it's less, less damning. I like yeah, it. Yes, <laughs> right? But, you know, I'm curious, now that you mentioned self-rejection, I see that a lot with my clients, not just with herpes, but in general, like in long-term relationships, people can do a form of self-rejecting. And the way I'll see it is um, maybe a partner, so they'll be with a partner for a while, and maybe a partner just says something slight like, oh, I'm a little tired. And that's the way they might reject themselves from even trying to initiate sex with a partner because they're like, oh, well, the feeler's not out there. But I just want to make it clear. I mean, you can have tired sex. <laughs> you can even have sick sex if you're at like a three on the 10 scale of sickness, just saying. But... <laughs> Recovering sex. Re- well, yeah, recovery. On the downside. Well, I mean, I, I would just say, yeah, you're you're coming down. You may still have a little cough. <laughs> just kiss over here. All oh, right. <laughs> no, but so like, uh, why I'm what I'm trailing this back to is, do you think that sometimes people might self reject even in a relationship? Um, you know, maybe would herpes sometimes stop them from like, you know, they wouldn't want to do this. Oh, it's going to, there's going to be so much work to the, Mm. I don't know. I'm just wondering if you see any of that. So what I'm thinking, what comes to mind as you say, this is, um, let's say someone discloses to someone, Mm -hmm. um, there, let's say that I disclose to a woman who doesn't have herpes, right. Or Mm -hmm. she gets tested, comes back negative and I'm positive. And this person still wants to be with me. I can reject myself in a way that sort of self-sabotages the relationship moving forward because I'm questioning my worthiness. Like, who am I to be with this person who's going to be with me despite having this horrendous disease? And why would anyone want to have sex with me after this? Like, what, what, what's so special about me? I'm not anybody. And this is a thing because, like, we'll get into the relationship and just not believe the other person in a lot of cases that they just like us. Like, why is it so hard for a person to just believe someone just likes you and doesn't care about the potential vulnerabilities of contracting herpes. Well, and that goes back to what you were saying. Just mentally, you've got to be in a place where you learn to love yourself and accept this part of yourself. Because if you don't believe yourself to be lovable as a person, then... It doesn't matter if somebody says, oh, you're hot. Ooh, I want you. Uh, you're, let's do it. Because your inner monologue is basically telling you you're unworthy. You're not sexy. They're just lying to you. They're just saying that to make you feel better. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that's a very, that's a very, 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 very common thing um, huh. for people who, and this is why we live in a generation now where people will ghost you know, if you're not familiar with, I do know what ghosting, is. but tell them. All right, so it's just where you know, let's say you have dialogue with someone you're potentially dating. Uh, things are going well. Maybe you make plans to meet up, and they just suddenly stop communicating. They just stop communicating, or even like phantoming, where they just sort of phase out of the conversation. That's one that I like. They just die, <laughs> like slowly. at least physically die. <laughs> yeah, but that's another reason that people make ghosts. Like. I know that I've done it in the past with people where it's like, oh, you've presented yourself as a very judgmental person that I don't want to divulge this very uh, personal information to because if you're judgmental about, you know, uh, any of my friends or a situation or a topic of conversation, then you're going to be that way towards me. So I'm just at that point, like I've shut down, I've decided, all right, well, we're not going to have this conversation. I don't need to see you again or talk to you anymore. And so this is something that I want people to know as well in the dating world that ghosting could happen for a number of reasons. Like this person may not be an asshole for ghosting, which I mean is in form of emotional abuse, but they may just be doing it out of a place of, well, I don't think that this may be a good fit. Yeah. So I read, I recently read an article about ghosting and it basically said that um, the that people have very serious senses of abandonment as a result of ghosting. So when I, I personally uh, got divorced in 2018, December, and when I started dating, I, I remembered reading this ghost thing and I was like, you know what? 
I will at least be clear with people that I'm ending this because I just don't think it's a good fit, you know? And so I did do that, but I definitely experienced the ghosting thing. One of the craziest one was I was on a date and it was going well. We had even kissed and we were driving from one location to the next, like, let's go to dinner now. And then he just disappeared. <laughs> and I was like, that's not funny. What the hell just happened? I really thought he died or went to jail. <laughs> Did you ever hear from him? I, no, it was a full-on ghost, which was so weird because we were in the date, just driving to wow. another location. So I was like, did he get into an accident? Was he arrested? What Did he get a DW? Because like we had been drinking, but I, I hadn't been drinking enough that it would impact anything. But he... Oh <laughs> so my. I wondered, I was like, what if he got a DWI and he was too embarrassed to say anything? I have no idea. I'll never know the story. That's the point. It's this endless loop. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So here's uh, what I'm going to blow your mind with this one. So zombie right. is a thing. So if you Zombying. were to suddenly get a text from him that's like, so where are you at? <laughs> what you doing? Coming back from the dead like that. Like So ghosts turn into zombies where they just kind of so creep their way back into your life after their situation changes. So maybe <laughs> he didn't want to risk his other relationship or whatever. That, you never know yeah. if somebody... And honestly, the way I... Rejection is uh, probably a good situation. I always tell people, you know, like... It's, it's a good thing to get rejected, especially if it wasn't a good situation, you know? And yeah, it hurts in that time, but it's better to like... If, if it happened, it probably wasn't meant to be, and it opens you up to like more options. I think the ghosting thing is just, to me personally, it's, I, I get why people do it, but I think it's just kind of cowardly. And I want people to just say, look, I'm not interested. Go, move on with your life. Live. <laughs> and that's a maturity thing, too. Um, <laughs> That might be because I'm uh, my eight older years. You well, know? I mean, not even that. Mm -hmm. I, it's maturity, period. Um, it's a common thing for immature people to just not know how to handle conflict. Or uh, okay. if I were to just be like, I don't think this is a good fit. I don't want to hurt your feelings. So mm -hmm. the intention behind ghosting is all across the board. Maybe I don't want to hurt your feelings or yeah, maybe I've I don't want to be honest. Like, But it is better to, like what you said earlier was, I don't think this is a good fit. Mm -hmm. And then that other person's going to be like, well, why? Tell me why. Give me reasons. And maybe you just don't have one or don't want to give one or don't want to be honest with yourself. And I mean, it's better to it is better. Like now that where I'm finding myself mm -hmm. at now is in a much more mature space and willing to just be honest with people. Hey, it's because this exact reason mm -hmm. we're not a fit. Yeah, well, and I just think it's hard, too, because, you know, to be fair, when I would do it, some of them would be like, okay, cool, uh, thanks for letting me know, and others would be like, the feeling's mutual. <laughs> I was like, like, no, it's not, you liked me. <laughs> or just, like, throw out irrelevant stuff and be like, well, I didn't like you anyway. <laughs> Like, let's be mature here. Well, you know, everybody, dating is hard for people and rejection is hard for people. All right, so we're towards the end of the podcast. Are there any kind of final thoughts? I don't know, just things I haven't asked you yet about that are important that people should know or, you know, just like that message that you want people to kind of go home with about about your Ooh. herpes, your podcast. <laughs> I don't know um, if I wanted to say about herpes or if I was just like, no, about life. <laughs> um, I'll say... The podcast and at this point is at 121 episodes of just different people's experiences. And I touch on my own personal experiences as well. Um, the most important thing I would say is that we have so much misinformation out there in general, specifically about herpes, STIs. And it's important for us to understand that to be the case. Like there's no right answer there's no you know real honest answer like we just have our different experiences with whatever our circumstances are and it's important for us to take time to discover what that means for us it's important for us to be able to know what we're communicating with intention to partners and um being able to do whatever we can to reduce their vulnerabilities to the virus. So speaking from the experience of a person who has herpes, I think that's an important piece there. Um, seeking support. It's a very liberating thing to be a part of a community of people who just understand and you can potentially vent, exchange experiences. But that's been the most powerful part of the healing process after your sexual, your identity has been 
challenged after having it so interconnected with your sexuality. So um, I just want to encourage people to do that, like take time to self-examine and look at what it means to you and often see if there's any lessons that are at the end of the herpy <laughs> rainbow or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I love the herpy rainbow. Yeah. <laughs> so Courtney, how do, how do people find you? Um, so you can go to spfpp.org and that's the website. I have all of my contact information there on Instagram. I'm at H on my chest, which is like Han my chest. So the letter H and then O N my chest, as well as Twitter, Tumblr, Reddit. Um, and then you can like the Facebook page of something positive for positive people. I'm always looking for guests too. So if you're someone who's open to sharing your experience living with an SCI, um, I'm very easy to find and connect with and we can get together about that. Um, one more thing is that as of late, the podcast has now become a nonprofit that is aiming to serve stigmatized communities in general, just given a lot of the discussions that have come up have been around mental health, uh, the public health field, um, sex education, sex positivity, and social justice issues as well. So you'll hear a lot of that in the episodes, but what we're working to do is support all, as many as possible stigmatized communities through navigating their own healing processes. Excellent. Thank you so much, Courtney, for joining me today. And of course, I'm Angela Skirtu. This has been www.aboutsexpodcast.com. And you can also find me as a therapist, if you like, at www.therapistinstlouis.com. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. And stay kinky, St. Louis.